festival individuals. We got things to do, and and uh, but somehow, some way, we get distracted. We lose focus in the main thing, the priorities of life. And so, this is why we gather once a month to remind us who's our priority, who's number one, where do we got to focus all of our energy at, or most of our energy at. So, Father, I thank you that you've allowed us to come together once again. We surrender this uh, fellowship to you. Men that want to just become more like you. Men that want to rise higher. Men that want to go deeper and further. Men that are broken. Men that are incomplete. Men that haven't arrived. Men that are imperfect. Men that have had many failures. Men that have weaknesses. All of us fall in those categories. But we also thank you that there's a billion reasons why you died for us and you don't remember any of that stuff. You just continue to bless us, empower us. Take, you continue to help us be our strength and be our rock. Lord, today I ask you to bless me and my brother. And uh, I ask you, Lord, to help us bring this word that you got for us, for, for the men, that we all can grow together, Lord, that we can just become a little better than we were before we came in. And that's the purpose of these uh, once a month men's fellowship. Lord, we need each other. We need each other. And sometimes we're not transparent. Sometimes we're not real. Sometimes we hide, it. We hide our faults. We hide our, we hide our shortcomings. But Lord, here we are to be real and transparent. To help each other rise higher for, you, for the kingdom glory. And I know that you're going to have your way here this morning. So Holy Spirit, have your way. Can we say Holy Spirit, have your way? In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's share this real quick with the Facebook uh, world. Get your phone, put it on camera, and go ahead and share it to one of the platforms that you got there so we can do what we got. I'm going to share mine on, on Facebook. So uh, here you go. Ron Mandola, you may be seated. Thank you. I'm just sharing. Hang on. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just be with me today and deliver what you have. So the Lord's been having me in the book of James for the last month and a half. And so we're going to kind of delve into primarily chapter 3, the first section of James, uh, where it talks about the tongue, okay, and how we use it. So the book of James is different than uh, a lot of the other uh, New Testament books. It's not about the life of Christ or the history of the church. It's uh, not a prediction of what will happen. And it's not high-minded theology. The book of James is about wisdom. And in fact, a section after where I'm going to talk goes into godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom. But we'll do that another time. Um, it says offers the readers practical advice about giving life that glorifies God. So we're going to talk about words, right, and the power of the tongue. So I want to remind you that your words have power, and what you say matters. What you, says, what you say has an effect over your life and uh, over other people's lives, your children, your family, and so on. And the Bible is very clear about this. So I'm going to throw a lot of scripture at you. Because I'm not a preacher. <laughs> I'm just giving what the Lord showed me, man. Okay, so the first one is Proverbs 18, verse 21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it eat its fruit. What we say matters. When we talk to our kids, how you approach your kids, what you say, you can bless or you can curse, right? And then some people take that. Differently, some people will be motivated by that, and some people, it will affect them for life. So you got to be careful about what you say. Proverbs 12, verse 18. There is one who speaks like, uh, like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. Ephesians 4, verse 29 says, Let no corrupt words proceed from your mouth. But what is good and necessary... Uh, for necessary edification that may impart grace to the hearers. And that's what the Bible does. It edifies. It builds us up, right? That's why we read it. God encourages us. 
so that we can go on through our day. We can become more Christ-like down the road. You know, we're trying to do this day by day as we grow. When you get saved, like Pastor Eddie says, we're in the sanctification period now. So day by day, we're getting more and more like Jesus, hoping to get more and more like Jesus. We'll never be perfect, but we got to strive for that. Hey, Papa. <laughs> All throughout the Bible, it's clear that what you say matters. What you say about yourself matters. And the words you speak over your life matters. So you can bless and curse yourself. You know, how many times have we just said things in jest? Oh, I'm stupid or whatever, you know. You, you, you know what I mean? And that once that comes out of your lips, it's in the atmosphere what happens? That's when the devil can use it, right? It says he roams like a roaring lion, roams the earth looking for those who he can devour. So you got to be careful. King David said in Psalms 141, verse 3, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. That's a good prayer. Now, I believe that we all need this prayer. A guard has to be set over our lips so that when we do not bring, we not bring unwanted consequences due to the words we speak. I encourage you today to align yourself with the word of God and align your speech with God's word. There's power in declaring good things over yourselves. And there's even more power in declaring God's word over yourself and over your family and your kids. Begin to confess that. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I mean, we're so trained. I mean, come on. 20 years military, Air Force, retired. We're so trained. And I don't know if you know, you got to be a rough dude to be in the military. And the Air Force is probably the milder one out of the four. Well, out of the, compared to the Army and the Marines. But let me tell you, those guys, it's constant ribbing all day long. And it's who can, you know, who can say or who can outwit the next guy. So, and we're, we're brought up like that. How to put somebody down, get one up on them. But God's word is the opposite, right? So, confess Isaiah 54 verse, 17, uh, 54, verse 17. This is the pastor's favorite verse. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment shall, you shall condemn. That's one of his favorite verses. He prays that a lot. I encourage you to speak. Make declarations that are in line with the word of God. Begin to say, as it says in 2 Timothy verse, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. See, I mean, that's how we need to pray, too. When we get up in the morning, we pray. We pray God's word back to him. Not only putting in the atmosphere. Remember, God stands in line with his word. So he's not going to go against his word. If you're quoting scripture in your prayer and you're decreeing and you're declaring things over your family, you're telling God, you said this, you promised this, and God's a promise keeper. We know that, right? He keeps his word, and he stands by it. He doesn't go against it. But like I said, the devil also hears it. So when you're speaking God's word, be like what Jesus did when he was in the desert. And I got that a little bit later on, but yeah, he fleed eventually. Okay? Uh, Psalms chapter 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in horses and some trust in chariots, but I will trust in the name of the Lord. Our words are powerful and can change the world around us for good, or they can uh, set the world on fire for evil. <laughs> the book of James has a lot to say about how we use our words. So here's the, the main crux of it right here. James 3, verses 2 through 12. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, if we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body, look also at ships. Although they are so very large and are driven by the fierce winds, 
They are turned by a very small rudder whenever the pilot desires or wherever the pilot desires. So the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a word of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our words, or bless our God and Father. And with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God, the likeness of God. Out of our mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. Many brethren, my brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does not a seed, uh, does not a spring send forth fresh water and bitter at the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. It's powerful. Pastor was sharing something last night when we were at a prayer meeting about how he was having a great day. And I had the same, I had the same thing. I didn't say anything because he took my thunder. But uh, great day, started morning. We're going to have a meeting with the prayer team. You know, everybody over, pray, worship. Awesome night we had. We had and uh, just prayed for everybody. And, and he, he was confessing about how he was, <laughs> got up in the morning and on his knees, great morning until about 4 o'clock when he was on the road. Man, that happens a lot in Miami, doesn't it? <laughs> I had the same experience. I was driving down to Homestead to pick up the food from Mama Mia's, and somebody's in the left lane and backing everybody up. And, you know, I'm flashing him the lights. He won't get over. Finally, you know, when I go around him, then later on he tries to catch up to me, and he's, you know, you're number one. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> I was, and I was about to use a few uh, choice words, but... I said, okay, Lord, I, I got it. You're testing me. <laughs> when he said he had the same experience, you know, so it's like every day. He said, he said Lord, what was that, uh, that song? Was it uh, A Billion Failures? Yeah. yeah. That, that song, So Am I, yeah, it says the Lord, that, a, billion failure, uh, a billion failures disappear. You know, he forgives us continually. And I, he's saying, yeah, yeah, thank God. I'm thinking, man, I do a billion a day. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> okay, so let's get back to the, the, the bit in the mouth of the horse. If you ever watched a horse racer, you would see that they put a leather contraption, that whole thing, on the bridle, on the horse's face, basically. And uh, the bridle has a, a little piece in it called the bit, which, give, which, gives it, uh, which is given uh, into the horse's, or put into the horse's mouth. The big horse is controlled by the little bit in his mouth. You can turn him right or left, you know. That big beast is controlled by a small piece of steel. It's a couple inches long, right? A massive ship is also controlled by one of the smallest parts, which is the rudder. Think of all the parts on the ship, a lot of big parts. And what really directs the boat? It's the rudder, the device used for steering and maneuvering the ship or boat. It's one of the smallest pieces, but often it's the smallest things in our lives that have significant control over us. <laughs> the same is true of our tongue. While comparatively small most of our, uh, to most of our body, it has the most power and most control over our future and, and over all the other parts of our body. James compares our tongue to a forest fire and the fire of hell. The fire causes damage, right? Words can cause damage as well. The words you can say can destroy a relationship that you have built your entire life in 30 seconds by putting used. Didn't I tell you? But right? Come on. We've all been there. We've been on the receiving end, too, right? Both sides of the coin there. So you got to be really careful, especially with your kids, man. You don't know how much that can impact your kids. In verse 7 and 8, James talks about the power of humanity, and it shows how we can tame wild animals, right? Yet, 
we're still unable to control our tongue. You think of all the accomplishments we made over the past 2,000 years since he wrote this book. We've flown to the moon. We've created cell phones where we can talk to people on the other side of the world. We've created the automobile where we can travel all over the country. However, we have not found a way to control our tongue. That same tongue we use to praise God, we often use to bring other people down. Let's say you come up to me and tell me how great a person you think I am. I would be flattered and very thankful. However, in the next moment, you tell me you hate my kid. <laughs> I'd be full of anger, right? I'd be defensive, especially as a dad. Even though you praise me, it wouldn't matter because of all the words you use to bring my child down. We often do the same thing with God. We praise him, but then we gossip him, gossip him about and discourage his children, other people in the church, our own family members. I mean, man, uh, you know, I know I'm not just speaking to myself. This hits everybody. Our words truly matter. Since they hold so much weight in our life and the life of those around us, we should try to control our tongues. One way for using our words for good is by giving encouragement to uh, encouraging messages to people, your coworkers, everybody. Holy Spirit lives inside of every believer, and as a believer, you may feel the nudge, the nudging to give you an encouraging word to somebody. That is often the Holy Spirit prompting you to use your words for good. Okay? Another way we can use our words for good is by keeping quiet. Sometimes things are not don't need to leave the lips, right? You got to hold it back. Uh, yeah, exactly, right? If you don't have something good to say, don't say it. Exactly. What good is it going to do? James 1, verse 19 and 20. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Simple. God says it right there. Shut up your face. <laughs> As they say in Italian. <laughs> or, you know, you just keep quiet. Sometimes it's not worth it. You know, you get into an argument with your wife that you know you're not going to win anyway. <laughs> Don't even bother going there. You save yourself a lot of grief. <laughs> Proverbs 11, verse 12 says, He who is devoid of wisdom despises his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his peace. If you are not gossip, if you are going to gossip or say something hurtful, it is best to keep it to yourself. We can also use our words for having good, hard conversations with people. This is by using the word of God when you know somebody's out of line with it. Matthew 18, it talks a lot about, you know, about this. If we, see, uh, if we see that sometimes we need to talk to people when they sin, and we all do, if I sin, confront me. I'm not going to be pissed off. I'm going to be thankful that you, you told me, you, you know, that's the way I am. You know, because let's face it, we all, like it's every day, we're, it's a constant battle. So we need to uphold each other, as the word says, iron and iron, right? So I need that accountability. And then we all do. So if you see something I'm not doing right, confront me. And I know he would say the same thing. Where did I go? We need to keep in mind that we need to speak with love and care when we're having the hard conversations instead of coming from a place of judgments or self-righteousness. It's not just about what you say, but how you say it. The truth is that at some point in our life, we will use our words for evil. That can be uh, discouraging to our spouse, our children, gossiping about a friend or talking harshly about a neighbor. We will have earthly consequences for those words. We all got to face him at one point. And he's going to open the book and he's going to say, yeah, you're saved. 
but look at all this garbage you did too. So, you know, we are going to confront that. We think we're getting away with it, but we're not getting away with anything. Because, but those words can also qualify someone to enter into hell because when we speak maliciously against our neighbor, we are not only sinning against a human, we are sinning against the Holy Spirit. But there is one who has always used his words for good. Where you or I have gossiped gossiped about a friend he always told the truth where you or I have assassinated somebody with our words his words led to life and that person is Jesus in Jesus we find forgiveness of our crushing words this really hits home bro in Jesus we find a way to control our tongue As we grow in a relationship with Jesus, he changes your heart, which will change the way you speak. So that's that refining every day, every day. Sanctification will never be perfect. So I encourage you to come to the one who can cause you to speak the words of life to those around you. Let me tell you something if you didn't already know. Your words, they matter. If you read the book of James, you will find it mentions the power of words. In chapter 3, it says, the tongue also is fire. Think about that. Why fire? Why would the tongue be likened to fire? He's trying to tell us that the same fire that brings warmth to the house is exactly the same fire that can burn the house down. What kind of fire are, you words, are your words igniting up? What kind of fire are you speaking? What flames come out of your mouth? You see, the thing about the words, once they ignite, they can ignite hope. They can ignite healing. They can ignite joy and love. Words have an impact when you speak. Words can hit someone and destroy them emotionally without even touching them. But words also have life. Child of God, when you speak and you uh, learn how to declare them, indeed, only God can create, can speak and create. But God has also spoken several promises in the Bible. As we believe, we can speak those promises into existence. That's what they say, speak it into existence. Speak God's word out. And then he hears it, and you get blessed. Speak negative things out, and that's what's coming at you. <laughs> so be careful how you're talking. God says if it aligns itself to my will, if you speak my name, if you believe you have faith that I can, then your words can move things in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm. In Mark 11, 12, 25, when Jesus was hungry, he was leaving out of Bethany. He saw uh, from afar off the fig tree with, le- uh, with some leaves. But when he got closer, he saw only leaves uh, that no f- uh, had no fruit due to it not being in season. And he said out aloud... Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. His disciples heard what he said, and the next day the disciples saw that the tree had died upon, dried up and died upon its roots. Power. Uh, He spoke something out, and it died. I mean, he's God, so. (laughs) But our words have impact. Jesus says in verse 22 through 24, have faith in God, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask for when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Prayers can be answered. When words are spoken in line with the word of God, and with the will of God. 
then healing will happen. Marriages will be restored. Ideas will become a reality. And generational curses can be broken. God tells us in his word that every tongue has incredible power. Will you use your words the right way? They have power to move mountains equally if misused. You speak without being, and you speak without being mindful of your words. You can cause your entire life to go up in smoke. I mean, has anybody done that here? Has anybody said anything negative about themselves? You know, let alone your friends saying something about you. But, you know, we've done that. You know, when you do something, I'll say stupid. <laughs> You know, we are told repeatedly in the word of God to be mindful of our words. First Peter three, verse 10 says, for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. There's so much in the Bible about our, our mouth. I look up, I just did a Google search. And, you know, show me scriptures of tongue over a hundred so it's a lot to say about it. Colossians 4 verse 6 says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Ephesians 4 verse 29, Let no corrupt, I think I said this one before, Let no corrupt words proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Proverbs 10, 19 says, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Proverbs 15, verse 4, a wholesome tongue is the tree of life, but perverseness breaks the spirit. Proverbs 21, verse 23, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. Don't say everything you want to say to your wife. <laughs> it's coming back at you like a boomerang <laughs> over and over the Bible repeatedly tells us the same message in different words in different ways excuse me words matter your words matter but what I really want to focus on the particular verses Proverbs eighteen twenty one. we said it before death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And we already talked about how we can bless and curse. Before we go any further, remember God himself spoke the universe into existence in Genesis. Now we're not God, but we're children of God. And by that virtue, we have been told to ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. We have been told that life and death are in the power of the tongue. We have been told that a wholesome tongue is the tree of life. Repeatedly, we, have, we, we too have the message that we can speak things into existence concerning our own lives and in, the line of, in line with the many promises of God. But start speaking the word of God upon your circumstances. If it's a promotion you want, start, uh, start saying, I'm the head and not the tail. God, please promote me. If it's a skill you need, start claiming, I can do this because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Romans 10, verse 17 says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you begin to speak the word of God audibly, repeatedly, you will constantly be hearing the word of God. And that's when faith comes. So if I keep speaking, speaking, Romans 8, verse 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Or Deuteronomy 28, 13, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 1 John 4, verse 4, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Repeatedly declaring the word of the Lord, I hear it, my faith grows, and I, my belief grows. It's good. You know, uh, Tracy and I have been for, since the kids were little, we play the, God of, the word of God at night. We listen to the Bible at night while we're sleeping. Because your subconscious mind still hears it. And like Pastor has said, and we know, 
the demons start at 12.01 and to 3 o'clock in the morning is when they're most active. But you're sleeping. You're kind of defenseless. You know, we pray before we go to sleep, but hearing the words subconsciously, we got to go. Actually, we play it all day long in our bedroom. We have the word of God going. And in the front room, we have the worship going. <laughs> Put YouTube on the premium channel and just let it roll. We got all these videos and stuff. We just let it roll. So it's always going through the house. So it's good. You're constantly hearing. You're edifying yourself. You're building yourself up. And guess what? You still fail. You still mess up, even with all that. But it does keep you in check. It does a lot. Because if I didn't do that, or if I didn't, if I didn't get into this, if I didn't read this daily or spend time with God, whew, I'm dead. Mark it on my tombstone. <laughs> I'm gone. <laughs> My thought life begins to change because I'm meditating on the word of God. And when I speak the word of God, when you speak it, you're not just, it's not just feel good sentences. The word of God is living, it's truth, and it's powerful. For example, when Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and nights with no food or water, he was fasting. He was in a weak state. The devil tried to tempt him. What did he do? Quoted the word of God three times. And, you know, in the Bible it says, after he did that, the devil fled for a time. He's always coming back. He's always looking for opportunities to stick the knife in and twist it. So this is why we got to stay in this word every day and be encouraged and, and, uh, and lifted up. And like I said, brothers are helping brothers out. He drew strength and he used the powerful word of God against the devil and defeated him. When we speak his word into our lives, that is when we can begin to see the power of the words and the word of God that brings life. The Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue. So the tongue is capable of speaking life into situations we face or we pray about to the people we interact with and the children we raise, our spouses, a great example is that if you ask people what has caused the most pain in their life, you'll find that it's usually when words spoken to, uh, to them or about them by someone whom they loved and trusted has more, it has more of an effect than any physical attack that you could do because it's lasting. The pain from getting a butt beating will go away after a day or two, but emotional scars last forever if you don't deal with them. They can be dealt with through the word of God. That is because words can touch our emotions and anything that can move you emotionally has a lasting impact on your life. Just like a teacher telling a student, you'll never amount to anything. But to, you can react two different ways, right? Some people will take those hurtful words and run with it and make something better of themselves. They'll say, oh, I don't believe you. I'm, I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to do the best I can be. And they might become a, a successful entrepreneur. But those same hurtful words can take us, uh, another person and impact them negatively when he says, you know, that his life will never amount to nothing because he believed those words and the te uh, that the teacher spoke over him, and he gave up. He might wind up homeless, or, you know, in ruin, do harmful things, you know, commit suicide, do things that are wrong, whatever. So we have impact on people's lives. Your words can have a lasting effect on people. Your words can speak life into your own situation, if you're facing an illness, you tell yourself, by his stripes I am healed. Jesus has come to give me life and life more abundantly. And you'll begin to see your faith grow. Now, I had an example here. I can just talk through it real quick, and I'll give the mic over to Pastor. Remember when Elijah was facing the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings, I think 18? He kicked some booty, or the Lord did. 450 prophets got wiped out. 
commanded the uh, fire to come down from heaven, and then they wind up killing all those prophets. It says the next day, Jezebel spoke this. I want you to listen to this. This is in 19. I'll find it. Bear with me. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> so after he had done all that, he said, it says in 19, verse 1 and 2, And they have told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more so, more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow. So what did he do? Did he stand up after he had just done this great victory? No, he cowered. He ran into the cave and he hid <coughs> until, the God, until the Lord, the angel of the Lord came to him and spoke to him. You go a little bit further in, verse, in chapter 21, verse 23, he's talking to Ahab and telling him what a dirtbag he is as a king. <laughs> Not following the right things. He says in verse 23, And concerning, the, concerning Jezebel, the Lord has also spoke, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. It's in the atmosphere. Go to 2 Kings chapter 9. Verse 30. Jehu was the commander of the armies. I think he was becoming king, and then and this is when Elisha is there, not Elijah. But he says, Now when Jehu had come to Je Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through the window. And then as Jehu entered at the gate, she said to him, Is it peace, Zimri, murderer of your master? And he looked up at the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? So two or three eunuchs looked out at him, and then he said, throw her down. And so they threw her down, and some of her blood spattered on the wall and on the horses. And he trampled her underfoot. And he had gone in, and he ate and drank. And he said, go now and see this accursed woman and bury her, for she was the king's daughter. So they went to bury her, and they found no more than her skull and feet and the palms of her hands. Therefore, when he came back and told him, what, uh, told, told him, and he said, this is the word of the Lord, which was spoken by the servant Elijah the Tishbite, back in Kings two, uh, 1. He spoke it into existence. She, she spoke her own death. She cursed herself by saying, "If it, even so, if it hasn't... Uh, if, if this doesn't come to pass, let it be as uh, what, the, what happened to these prophets of Baal, that I die, basically. So she spoke her own death, and God heard it. Difference between her and Elijah, he was a godly man. That's what we are. So be careful what you say. That's all I got. Thank you, brother. A lot of meat and potatoes there. We can guard our. Uh, we can try to guard our tongue, very hard, but we can with God Almighty by our side. You know the story that I was uh, telling them yesterday when we were meeting at the uh, at his house. We had a little prayer time, and I was meeting with them. Like, and you know I woke up in a great mood yesterday. Uh, we had a great Thursday night Bible study about, about the uh, the new heaven and the new earth our new eternal home that's coming, we, 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 I felt great. It was 6.30 in the morning, and I was praying, and I felt wonderful. And all of a sudden, you know, um, my day was carrying on. My wife and I were, were, were clicking. We were in sync. Everything was going smooth. And at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we're coming back home, and right over here in Sunset and 117th Avenue, you know, I'm there, you know, I have not gotten this mad in a long time. Please don't judge your pastor. But um, I'm just, I mean, uh, we, we all get mad, I'm sure, with Miami traffic. But let me tell you something. 
the imperfectness of God. I mean, the imperfectness of us and the perfectness of God. Because like he said, you made a great point. The devil tries to stick the knife and then twist it. And then we rebuke him. He leaves, but then he wants to come back. And so the thing about it is, you know, I was walking in the spirit yesterday. I blessed uh, a gentleman that was working in Michael's uh, store, the store of Michael's there. And I blessed him and I gave him a word. Uh, two people I witnessed gave him a little word, you know, gave him a little track, you know, gave him a little business card. You know. And, and I, was in, I was walking in the spirit all day. And then all of a sudden, without any warning, <laughs> I'm about to do a left. I'm about to do a left there in Sunset and 117 right by BJ's. And all of a sudden, you know, the car in front of me is stopped. And I'm like, okay, so let me be gentle. I'm not one of these that, you know, honks on the horn. Beep! That's, that's not me. That's not me. I'm very gentle, actually, when I drive. Yeah, you want the parking space that bad? Take it. You know, I'm like that, you know. So all of a sudden I go, beep, beep. You know, like very, like, beep, like giving her a reminder. She goes up. Oh, it, it was a she, obviously, later on. But uh, she goes up like 10 feet and stops again. It's a left turn. It's a left signal already ready to turn. Beep, beep. I'm like, what the heck is this person doing? Beep, beep. And, and then she goes a little further. The, and then all of a sudden, you know, like the, the light turns red. And I miss making my left turn. And I lost it. And so, <laughs> so I'm like, what the hell is this lady doing? And I'm, I'm going like that, and, and my wife is like, "Honey, honey, honey, what's going on?" I'm like, oh, "What the hell is wrong with her?" You know, and I, I pull her right next to her, and I'm like, "Look at that And I'm like, and all of a sudden she's looking at me, and she's like, "You know, why does five minutes matter if you have to wait another three, four, five minutes in the red light? Why does it matter?" I go, "It's not the three to four or five minutes." And then, and then, of course, when your wife is correcting you, yeah, at that moment, it makes it worse. I go, I go, look, when I get like that, just leave me five minutes alone. I'll be all right. Don't lecture me in those three to five minutes. So anyway, so all of a sudden, you know, I, I told her, I go, it's not about the three to four to five minutes. It's not about that. It's about the selfishness of the driver that all, what they wanted to do was in that left lane, they wanted to turned the other way and wanted to go to the right but there was cars there so instead of like them making a left and then doing a u-turn and going back in that direction they waited there inconveniencing me and inconveniencing the drivers behind me and everybody honking going crazy because of this selfishness of this person that didn't want to just make a left do a u-turn and go on but instead they she stayed there and then she made a right hand turn ahead of the oh my i was just mad I was just mad. But anyway, I cooled off, and uh, my wife was, you know, I go, honey, when I get like that, no lectures. Let me do what I got to do. I go, yeah, but I've never seen you that mad <laughs> in a long time. I go, yeah, I don't get mad, but it was just like the selfishness and the nerve of this driver just really got to me. But anyway, enough about that. I wanted to, first of all, I want to say this. Sometime, Ralph, I want you to do this. How many of you own guns and you want to go shooting? Raise your hands. Okay, uh, we're going to try to set up uh, a men's night, maybe on a Tuesday night, a men's night to go to uh, the gun range over there, I uh, forgot his name, uh, Stoneheart, my buddy Gerald who comes to the church every now and then, he's the owner, we're going to go there, we're going to try to reserve like two or three lanes so we can go and do some shooting with our guns and have a nice fellowship, uh, and maybe go have coffee or go have something afterwards, M maybe not this Tuesday, but the next, if you can set it up. And then let me know. Let me, raise your hands. Who wants guns and who wants to go shooting? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, eight people. So we're going to go maybe get like two lanes, two or three lanes. And uh, we can do that. All right. Today, in this little half hour that I got for you, I wanted to talk about God and our busyness. I appreciate the amens. But um, I, I, God and our busyness. How many of us are busy? I knew that every hand was going to stand up. We're all busy men with responsibilities. Every one of us is busy. 
The main excuse that we do all the time when people say, hey, what happened? How come you didn't call me? How come you can't come? I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. Busyness is the thing that we all have to deal with. But here's a story that, I, that I'm going to give you, and I want you to turn to it now in 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings chapter 20. And what I'm going to talk about today is men in our busyness and God in our busyness because we need to prioritize. And this story really hit me in 1 Kings 20 because the devil keeps us busy many times with things that have nothing to do with the main thing, God Almighty. And he keeps us busy and makes us believe, a lot of times we believe, that it is God's will that we're busy. But if you're constantly busy in things that are taking up your time and sacrificing your time and fellowship with God, you're too busy. And so in reality, it's really that it's the devil's plot to take us away from what? If we're too busy, if we're too busy, he's basically trying to take us away from prayer. If we are too busy, he's trying to take us away from reading the Bible. If we are too busy, we sacrifice from church. No, I got to cut my lawn. No, I got to work. No, I made an appointment too. And you make all these appointments and these things that are very important get sacrificed. And then you get to the point where here you are, you're rising higher. But then all of a sudden, your life in the spirit takes a detour. And I've, I've seen this, and it applies for every single human being, male or female, that when they don't go to church, something happens that they drift, they drift, they get cold. They, there's a falling away in their life. They're, they don't feel connected with God. All these things begin to happen because we're too busy. And the reason why we're too busy is because we don't prioritize right. Because if you prioritize right and you put the main thing, the main thing, the priorities of life, and you do the, the priorities of life, which is God, your health, family, all this is in the book back there, for ministry or your job, or if you're a student, your, uh, your school, and then the hobbies of life, fishing, diving, golf, whatever, hobbies. If you get to your priorities down pack right, your decisions for the main thing become easier. But when we don't do that, then we lose the man, and we don't guard the man. I want you to say this with me this morning. I need to guard the man. You're going to understand what I mean when we read this passage right here. Because we will not grow spiritually, which is the main thing, if we don't guard the man. We need to guard the man. It's the main thing. And we talked about this on Thursday, that everything that you see, the clothes that you're wearing, the cars that you're driving, the house that you live in, the, the, the money inside your wallet or in your bank account. Everything that you see will have no value when we go into the next life. And I'm not talking about just death because we're all going to die unless Jesus comes. But we're talking about the chain of events that, you know, eventually there's going to be a rapture. The church folks are going to be caught up with Jesus in the clouds and go into heaven. Seven years of tribulation, hell here on earth. Then Jesus is coming back and putting his feet in Jerusalem. Then with, with us coming down with him from heaven in the seven years while we're in heaven. And then he's going to destroy those that are against him. Then we're going to live a thousand years with him called the millennium. All this has been spoken in the last 20 weeks of the book of Revelation. And then... There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So what you see in heaven and what you see here on earth is going to be passed away. Nothing that you have right now will have any value in that next life. So is it important or is it not important? 
to guard the man. And this is what I have for you in 1 Kings chapter 20, and we're going to go to verse 39. I don't want to read the whole story for lack of time, but I'm just going to get right to the meat and potatoes. In verse 39, it says, Now as the king, this is a story kind of like a, a brave heart story. Imagine, how many of you have seen Braveheart? One of my top three movies. Uh, Braveheart, uh, The Gladiator. Uh, Braveheart, this is like a, 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 brave, a Braveheart movie where, you know, um, uh, what's it, William Wallace is there, you know, like you know, starting to get the troops ready. There's, uh, you know, there, there's um, testosterone rolling and all this and all that. And all of a sudden it says, now as the king passed, we know that Jesus is our king. But in this, in this story is the king Ahab. Now, as the king passed by, he now as the king passed by, he cried out to the king and said, Your servant went out into the midst of the battle. And there a man came over and brought a man to me and said, Guard this man. In this, I'm using this passage. To guard this man, you. Now check it out. Look what the king says. If by any means he is missing. Sometimes we miss the man because we don't guard the man. If by any means this man is missing, your life shall be for his life. Or else you shall pay a talent of silver. Verse 40. While your servant, now the servant was busy. The, the king came. Let me just break the story real quick. The king, the king told the servant, hey, your number one responsibility is to guard this guy. Maybe it was like the guy was a prisoner. Maybe he was, a, you know, like one of these uh, bad influence, influential people. And he says, your, your only job, your only job is you got to guard this man. I don't want you, I don't want him escaping. I don't want him missing when I get back. Your job is to guard this man. In this case, in the spiritual, guard this man. But in this story, guard this man. So the servant says, no problem, no problem. I'll guard this man. I'll, pro I'll protect this man. I'll, I'll, I'll be here with this man. I won't take my eyes off of this man. I will prioritize that this is the guy that I got to take care. That out of all the responsibilities that are out there, I got to guard this man. And the story reads... While your servant was busy, and there he was gone. So in other words, the servant got busy. And in his busyness, he took his eyes and his focus out of guarding the man. He got distracted, and because of that, he was gone. Then the king of Israel said to him, So your judgment... B, you yourself have decided it. Can we turn to the New Living Translation in that for a second, uh, media team, if you can? Because, let me read something here for a second. So now, the king passed by. He cried out to the king and said, Your servant went out into the midst of the battle, and there a man came over and brought a man to me and said, Guard this man. If by any means he is missing, your life shall be for his life. While your servant was busy, there he was gone. So in this story, your number one priority. What is the number one priority? Let me ask you, gentlemen, and the gentlemen watching online. What is your number one responsibility as a man? Can anybody tell me? What is every man here and every man watching online? What is our number one responsibility? Can somebody tell me? Guard the man. Guard you. Your number one priority is not your wife. Your number one priority is not your children. Your number one priority is not your ministry. Your number one priority is not your job or your business. Your number one priority is not your hobbies. Your number one priority 
is to guard the man. Guard you. You can't teach your children to teach their children how to guard themselves if you can't even guard you. If you can't take care of this man, meaning you, I'm sorry, but you won't be able to influence your family. If you don't take care of you, the man, you can't impact or influence anybody. Right. Jesus is coming, right? Yes or no? Jesus is coming. The king is coming. The king, Jesus, king of kings, lord of lords, he's coming one day. And he's going to ask you one question. What did you do while you were here on earth for me? Did you guard yourself? Did you guard the man? Because he's going to ask you that. If Jesus were to come tomorrow, is this man meaning you? Is this man being guarded right? Is this man being nourished right? Is this man growing in the spirit right? Is this man being balanced and prioritized right? We make all kinds of excuses for not praying. All kinds of excuses for not reading the word. All kinds of excuses for not going to church. All kinds of excuses for not growing spiritually. All kinds of excuses for continuing to walk in disobedience and not making the right choice. You know, you, it, it just time keeps on ticking and there is no change because the man is not being guarded. And further, and further to elaborate on this is not only that the man is not being guarded, but when you don't guard the man, you, eventually you drift. Eventually you, you fall away. Eventually, I don't care who you are and how many times you've read the Bible, eventually you will get cold because you're not guarding the man. So you make all kinds of excuses. And sometimes it's not that we're lazy. Sometimes it's just that we lose focus. We get distracted. We listen to our wives instead of us leading our wives. Listen, I love my family, but I, I got to guard the man. I love my son, but I got to guard the man. And this story here, the man escaped little by little. And if you go and read the whole story and all that, basically the man was tied. He was like maybe on a chair right here. And all of a sudden, you know, little compromises happen. Little things happen. And this man would basically tell this other man or the king or the servant, should I say, the servant, and tell him, hey, hey, I'm just going to go over here, okay? Okay, but don't go too far. No, no, just right here, four feet away. And that's what happens with us with our compromises. And then the, the man would say to the servant again, hey, hey, I'm just going to go over here, okay? Okay. No, no, okay, but no further than that. Okay. Hey, by the way, I'm going to go over here. Okay, but that's it. I'm not going anywhere. Hey, listen, you're going too far. No, no, that's it. Just up to here. And before you know it, the little compromises, little compromises, little compromises get further and further away. All of a sudden, the servant lost his focus. He lost his, his, um, his responsibility. And instead of guarding the man, he lost the man. And all of a sudden, the man, when he saw that he was like far away and the servant was distracted, he got up and ran and took off. The king comes and says, hey, where's the man? And what did he say? I got busy. Our busyness will cause us to lose the man. And God doesn't want that. The man escaped little by little. You who you are will, will drift little by little. A little irresponsibility here. A little laziness here towards the priorities that God has for us. I want you, to, I want to, I want you to, to say something. We can't trust ourselves. We need God. 
We need Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. We, I, can't, I can't guard myself right unless I'm reading his word. Unless I'm coming to church. Unless I'm praying. Like I did, yes. Imagine what would have happened if I wouldn't have prayed at 6.30 in the morning with this driver making that left-hand turn. It could have been worse. Your flesh cannot be trusted. But one thing we need to do, gentlemen, is we need to guard the man. Because it said here in chapter 20, because if this man is missing, how was he missing? Because there was a lot going on. So I imagine... This was, was like a brave heart scene that a lot was going on, a lot of people yelling, a lot of people dying, a lot of fighting, a lot of stuff. And, hey, you got to guard this guy. Uh, but that's what happens in life. We're so busy, and there's so much going on for every one of us here that we're so busy that, you know what happens? Not only do we lose focus, not only do we get distracted, but here's the better part. We lose ourselves in the process. When you lose yourself, how can you impact your family? When we lose ourselves, how can you influence your family? How can you inspire your family? How can you be that voice in the wilderness, that voice in the desert, that voice in the dark? How can you be that if you have lost yourself? Things are just pondering your mind. There are many good men here watching online. There are, there's a lot of good men. But we're also many, many, many too busy men. And when you're too busy, you're just too busy. I got to do this. I got to do that. This man in this story, he wasn't lost on purpose. Many men that come to Jesus and have a relationship with Jesus and they start praying in the beginning and they read the word and they go to church, they, they didn't lose themselves on purpose. They lost themselves little by little because of their busyness. They're not prioritizing right. They dr the man drifted little by little. Here and there, here and there. Instead of guarding yourself and prioritizing right, You did not prioritize right. You didn't guard yourself. And little by little, here comes the weight, excess weight in your body. Little by little, here comes the compromise in your marriage and infidelity in your marriage. Here comes the fornication. And you're having sex and you're not even married and you continue to live like that. And God is not going to bless that. He just won't. And so little by little, it happens. I was talking to a gentleman the other day and And uh, he says, Eddie, you know, do you know why I don't cheat on my wife? I go, well, because God says that adultery is a sin. And he says, yeah, yeah, uh, that's the main reason why I don't cheat on my wife. But the other reason is they eventually tell. I'm like, what do you mean by that? He goes, if you lie to them or if you lie to, if, you, if they, they catch you in some selfish act or something and, and they get pissed off and they get anger, They will tell somebody, and then that somebody will tell your wife, and then, boom, there goes the marriage. They all will tell sooner or later. The main thing is don't do it because God says so. But there's a lot of women that will eventually tell. And so it will be found out sooner or later. Nobody, have you ever met anybody that's had a long affair that sooner or later they get caught? I have a buddy that he got his mistress pregnant the baby's now five years old he got his mistress pregnant I'm like how did you convince your wife to stay with you despite you having to now no she doesn't know that I have a child I go it's only a matter of time can you imagine this guy going to bed every day going to work the the, the thing about it like he's, I gotta cover myself I gotta cover myself I hey, what well, if If now the baby, when he becomes, or a yeah, boy, when the baby becomes like 15 and he, hey, dad, I want to talk to you. Hey, who are you talking to? Uh, no, I'm talking to this kid. Who, why are you talking to a 15-year-old? Eventually, something's going to happen. He has no peace because he's trying to hide his sin. When the king says, why did this man get lost? Were you empowered by an enemy? The servant said, no, 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 I wasn't. 
Were you seduced by a woman? No, no. Then why did you lose them? Did you get distracted with worldly affairs? No, 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 no. Were you too busy to prioritize right? Yes. Were you too busy to prioritize right? Yes. But here's the answer that we give. We give answers like, I'm too busy. Um, we give answers like, I was distracted. And so these things like, you're too busy to, you neglect your health. You're too busy and you forfeit quality time with your family. You're too busy and you don't go to church. So when you don't go to church, you don't hear the word, you don't grow in faith. And now you can't even pray for somebody. If somebody would, would tell you, hey, can you pray for me? I'm going through a divorce. Hey, can you pray for me? I'm sick. I just got diagnosed with cancer. Hey, can you pray for me? I'm in financial disarray. I lost my job. Hey, can you pray for me? My wife is leaving me. And, then, and you're like, uh, 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 uh. you don't even know how to pray because you lack faith. You've lost a man. You're focused on material things rather than spiritual things. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. Material world versus the spiritual world. The material versus the spiritual. We can gain the whole world with material stuff. But then at the end, what good is it going to be? What value is it going to be if we don't prioritize right? Too busy. And because we're too busy, we lose the man. But you know what happens when we lose the man? We become what the Bible says, lukewarm. What does what does Jesus say when you're lukewarm? He will vomit you out of the mouth. A lukewarm person is not hot for God. A lukewarm person is not even cold for the devil. They're just like right there, and it's like you know, it's like, and and God will vomit you. Because you can't make up your mind to serve God or to serve the world. To serve God and the spiritual things of, this, of, the, of his kingdom or to focus on the material things of this world. If you are back and forth with both, you are a lukewarm Christian. You can't influence your family like that. You can't make an impact with people like that. You can't cast out devils, pray for healing. You can't, you can't wake up with power. There are so many Christians in this world. There are so many churches in this world. But they lack the power of the Holy Spirit. They lack confidence. They lack that assurance that you can pray for something and the answer will come. You can't impact, influence, and pray in those conditions if you're lukewarm, if you lose the man, if you're not focused on guarding the man. You're, you're so focused on priority number three. You love your family, and I do too. I love my son. I'll take a bullet for him. But you know, my goal is not to make him happy. My goal is, as a spiritual head of the family, is to make sure he's aligned to the perfect will of God. My goal as his dad, as his father, is, and this is the role for men, because we're kingdom men. We have a role. My job is for him, even though he might not like it, what I say, my job is for him to be in the perfect will of God. And the perfect will of God is going to align itself to the things of the kingdom. Outside of the perfect will of God will align himself to the things of darkness. So you as, your, as, a, as a father... You as a husband, align yourself with the kingdom so that you can lead and guide your wife and guide your family right. But you can't make a big impact. You can't make a big influence. If you're so, you know, anti-growing spiritually, if you lose the man, like you don't even know who you are. Don't we have in America right now an identity crisis? Don't we have an identity crisis? Like these days, you don't even know who's a man anymore. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, got, you know, we don't even know who's a man. We got this, these sissies and these feminists, and, and, and there's not real men. Real men that influence and impact their family. Why? Because they've lost themselves. They haven't guarded themselves. Why? 
Because they're too busy. Why else? Because they're so focused on the material, on the temporal, on the things of this world, that it consumes them, and then they lose themselves in the process. Gentlemen, if you cannot keep this man, point to your heart right now, point to your heart right now. If you cannot keep this man, you will not be able to impact hundreds and thousands of other men. You'll just be a statistic. If you cannot keep and take care and guard this man, how in the world are you going to impact and inspire and influence other men? Forget your family. They take your family out of the equation. I'm talking, you were built not just to be a husband. You were built not just to be a father. You were built to be also a kingdom difference maker. Yes or no? So if you were built to be a kingdom difference maker, how are you going to impact, influence, and inspire other men if you can't guard this man? You have to fill this man with oil. We talked about this on Sunday. You have a lamp. We are a lamp. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, but he also said, you are the light of the world. And so if your lamp has no oil, there's no light. If there's no light, you can't impact, you can't inspire. So if your lamp is low on oil, that means you're empty. If you're empty, you're lukewarm or you're cold. How? You can't make an influence. You can't make a difference. You, you can do something, but it's not going to get you where you need to go. You need to be with oil and light of the world. Jesus said that a tree that doesn't produce fruit gets what? Pruned. Do you know why trees, do you know why there's a pruning process? Do you know why there's a pruning process? It's not to remove the bad from you. The pruning process is to take away the good from you and make you better. The tree is growing up to here. I've noticed this. Whenever I trim some of my trees and whatever, trees here and trees at the home, whenever I trim them, they start growing higher. In other words, good is the enemy of best. And some of us are just cool. We're okay with just good, but God wants best. God wants a spirit of excellence. God wants you to flourish, to prosper, to be enriched. God wants all of that. And sometimes he's got to prune you. So that you can go from your mediocre, not mediocre because good is above mediocre. So you can go from good to excellent or good to best. And sometimes it hurts, but we got to do that. How are you going to impact and inspire people when the internet has your eyes? How are you, you know, the internet has your eyes. Are you guarding your eyes? Are you, I know you're guarding the man, but when you're guarding the man, you got to guard your eyes because the eyes are the windows to the soul. And listen, we all, our eyes have looked a little longer to some of the beautiful babes in Miami. And sometimes, you know, I'm like, oh, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I have to continually guard the eyes because the eyes are never satisfied. So i got to con continually and so I got to make sure that this man is guarded. I got to make sure that these eyes are guarded and that I'm close to God. How are you going to guard your eyes if you're lukewarm? How are you going to guard your eyes if you're too busy? It's almost impossible because you're not getting the nutrients that you need to grow spiritually. As, we, as I close, gentlemen, keep this man free from addictions. Keep this man free from porn. Keep this man free from, free from perversion. Keep this man, guard this man from adultery. Guard this man from fornication. Guard this man from too busy. Guard this man so that you can prioritize the man right. Be a man that you bring your body into subjection. How do you do that? By renewing your, your, your mind. In, this, in the Bible, 
is a story about Samson, one of my greatest. I was reading, the, I was reading a story of, J, of Samson when I was 10 years old. This guy got a lion. He was strong and, and he was a bad dude. No steroids back then. He was just a, a great guy. And this guy, Samson, he beat a lion with his bare hands. A lion came after him, and, and he didn't get a spear or nothing with his bare hands. I don't know how he did it, but he got that big old neck of a lion. He killed the lion with his bare hands. But his life ended prematurely. The Philistines took his eyes because he couldn't guard his eyes. And he ended up as a slave. He, at, at the end there, he, he asked God for mercy to help him bring the, this temple down. And the temple fell and about 3,000 died. But Samson struggled in the battle of his eyes. And one thing is, listen, nobody's blind here. And one thing is that you look at a girl, well, wow, thank you. Jesus, you did a great job. And, and, and you know, and, and you can do that. You know, I've done that. I'm like, te la comiste, Dios, te la comiste. Te la comiste. Yeah, pero, you know, when you, start, when you start with this, whoa, 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 whoa. Oye, mamita. Then all of a sudden, yeah, you're crossing the line. And you're, not, and you're doing like Samson, who killed the lion. He, he destroyed, I believe it was like a thousand with the jawbone of a, of a donkey. A thousand. I mean, a thousand men. A thousand men coming after me. Here he is. He was anointed. He was a conquering warrior. Strong like an ox. But at the end, his purpose became premature, gone. Because he did not guard the man. May we leave here today guarding the man. May we leave here today prioritizing before we drift and drift away too far that the things of the kingdom are like foolish thing, foolishness to us. Guard the man. If you have lost yourself in this year in 2022, you've lost yourself, but you feel like you need to get that man back. And you want a second chance to guard this man. You're going to have to have a determination to fight. You're going to have a determination to fight. I want to pray for you, but you're going to have to have a determination to fight to get this man back and fight for this man, meaning you, so you can be the husband that you're supposed to be, so you can be the father that you're supposed to be, encouraging your children, not, you know, becoming a... A, a disturbance to them, but a, a, an encourager of your family to guard this man, to nourish this man, to make sure this man has oil, to make sure this man is guarded, to make sure this man goes to church, to make sure that this man is not just, because what happens is, you know, you come to church one Sunday, but then you miss one. And then you come to church, but then you miss two. You come to church, but then you miss three. And by the time you realize you don't come to church at all, how are you going to grow in faith? You haven't guarded the man. And God is speaking to some of us here this morning about guarding this man before we find ourselves empty without light and without oil. We have to guard this man. How many of you love your family? I love my family. I love my son. But I got to guard this man. I got to guard this man. I got to pray so that God can help me stay pure, stay humble in my assignment. May I may stay spiritually powerful. I got to guard myself. Life is going to throw negatives and life is going to throw positives at you. You still have to guard yourself. As a matter of fact, if you just imagine for a second a jumper cable for your car. What does it have? Jumper cable, two. It has two, two jumper cables on one end and two in the other. When you go, you put the positive with the positive, and there's also negative. Boom. Both bring power to your life. Sometimes we just focus on the positive, the positive, the positive. But doesn't God's word says in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for the good? 
even the negatives. So sometimes the positives in your life and the negatives that God has allowed in your life, they both work out for a greater power to ignite and inspire other lives. But if you're just focused on, I just want positive, I just want positive. No, no, sometimes uh, you need to also have the negatives because they all work in, in you. We can't be wandering off, gentlemen. We need to be guarded. We need to stop wandering, start, stop drifting before you end up cold. The Bible says, be free from idols. And when I mean by idols, I'm not talking about the Virgin Mary. I'm not talking about San Lazaro. I'm not talking about any of that. An idol, you know what an idol is? I'm going to tell you what an idol is. An idol is anything that you put above God. That's an idol. Your family can be an idol. Anything or anyone that you put above God is an idol. Your house, some people, all these things, it doesn't matter. Yeah, whatever you want to put here, if that becomes up here, it's an idol. And anything that you put above God is an idol. And God says, be free from idols. Anything that's above God is an idol. Guard the man before you lose the man. Guard the man before the man drifts. Guard the man bef before he wanders off. Guard the man. Guard him at all times. Don't take it for granted. Don't trust yourself. Trust in the God that's in you. But don't trust yourself because we all fall short. Don't trust your flesh because you're going to fall short. God gave you one responsibility. The king gave you one responsibility. Guard the man. Guard the man of all these things that I've mentioned. But the most important thing that takes us away from guarding the man, that causes us not to go to church, not to read the Bible, not to pray, that causes us not to work out, not to eat right, that causes us to be all focused on family, and, and we're so busy that we lose quality time with the family. We're so busy that we're always at work or we're always like prioritizing things. Anything that has your mind with so much occupation, in other words, what you spend your time on is what you truly idolize. I'm going to say that again. What you spend your time on the most, what you spend your time on the most is what you truly respect, is what you truly idolize. Do you wake up in the morning and you wake up with God? Are you guarding the man before you go out the door? Are you guarding this man that the enemy is trying like a roaring lion to defeat you and put you in bondage and put you distracted and take you out of focus? Guard the man. Leave out of those doors today, making sure that you make a decision to guard the man. May we stand?